I think at different times I've shared with uh, all of you that when it comes to giving uh, sermons, my, um, my, my way to do it is to just in prayer take the gospel that I've heard, just like you've heard, to God and in prayer ask God to help me understand what I would share. And sometimes that seems to come to me in a very clear, dramatic, dynamic kind of a way and the words are just flowing out all around me. And other times it comes very quietly. And that's what I wanted to say to you today. It's come to me in a very quiet way. It may be so simple. I'm almost embarrassed to share it because the thought I want to share with you under an anointing of the Spirit of God is so simple. Listen. In this story in John, we have a sort of a wonderfully dramatic opening. Then we have this historic, beautiful ending for God so loved the world that it becomes our anthem as Christians almost. And in between is a hinge point. In the beginning you have and Nicodemus came to Jesus by night. Oh, I like that so much. That is such a powerful image of this man, this great figure of the time, uh, skittering along in the dark shadows, hurrying to talk to Jesus, but not wanting anyone to see it happen. And you imagine it's almost by a lamplight that they have this conversation in the dead of night where this great teacher of the law, Nicodemus, wants to ask Jesus some important questions about the meaning of his teaching, and he seems confused by what? By the strange simplicity of what Jesus tells him. And then at the end, there is this announcement, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe in him will not die. What an amazing thing to say. We'll not perish, but have life everlasting. Somewhere in the middle of this movement in John, in these few sentences, this short number of passages, there is a powerful announcement of the entire meaning and purpose of the witness, presence, and ministry of Jesus of Nazareth. And he gives it to Nicodemus right in the middle of that lamplight conversation, in the most simple, breathtaking image. He says to Nicodemus, you must be born from above. Nicodemus doesn't understand that. Well, that's okay, because quite frankly, I don't understand it either. And I would be willing to bet that most of you don't get it any better than I do. If I said to you, uh, well, you want to know what the mystery of life is all about, what you need to do to get eternal life, you have to be born from above. What does that mean? Be born from above. No wonder Nicodemus doesn't understand it. Jesus goes on to say, what I'm telling you is, you need to be born of the Spirit. For those things that are born of the flesh are of the flesh, like all of us. But those things that are going to be born of the Spirit are going to be different. To be born from above, Jesus connects it to the next line of thought spiritually. You must be born of the Spirit. Are you any clearer now, church? If I said to you, okay, you don't get to be born from above, how about this? Then be born of the Spirit. What does that mean? Wow, it sounds good. It's poetic. It's beautiful. It's wonderful imagery. But what do I do with it? How do I understand it? How do I live that? How do I make sense of it as a, as a flesh and blood person? If I want to make the transition from being born of flesh to being born of spirit, how do I do that? Oh, Nicodemus by lamplight must have been scratching his head. And Jesus says, you're the great lawyer and you still don't get it. Boy, Nicodemus is standing in for everybody in the church this morning. He's going, no, Lord, so sorry. Yes, I've been going to church for years. I'm still a little hazy on this being born of the Spirit business. Jesus gives him a final, listen. Jesus gives him a final image, a final clue, listen, a final understanding. He uses the image of the wind. He uses the image 
of the wind. Did you hear that? Of the wind. If you want to be born of the Spirit, it's like, he says, you have to be like the wind. For the wind will go where it will go. It moves. Oh, brothers and sisters, do we ever understand that in Oklahoma? (laughs) Hell, we're finally getting somewhere, Lord. I think we're tracking with you now, Jesus. Uh, Yes, the wind of Oklahoma, it blows and it moves. It has a life of its own. It seems as though it is a living thing, though you cannot see it. Though it moves around you, nor can you control it. It is there. It is the breath, Ruach Elohim, as they say in Hebrew, the breath of God moving around us. You must be like that. But how can you be like that? Listen, how can you be like that if, like Nicodemus, you must move by night, weighted down by the fear of what others will think about you? How will you move like the wind if you are weighted down by the clanking number of laws and regulations and rules that you think define religion? How will you move like the wind if you are like Marley's ghost moving along carrying these heavy chains of guilt or shame? How will you move like the wind if you feel as though you are weighted down by worry, anxiety or fear? How will you move like the wind if you feel the heavy weight and burden of not knowing what will happen to you in this economy in which we live? You're anxious about your job, about your work, about your future. How will you move like the wind if you are loaded with all of those cares and anxieties of your daily life that seem to make you wake up every day feeling weak and tired? How will you move? Are you listening? How will you move like the wind if every day you see a flood of stories coming at you about what's happening in Japan as though the very air that we breathe would turn toxic and kill us? How will you move like the wind if you were weighted by sin? How will you move like the wind if you feel as though your feet are so heavy with loss and grief that every step you take is a step that is measured by the shortness of the time with which you have left to draw in the fresh breath that God has given you. How will you move like the wind? By letting go. By letting go. By spreading your wings. By unfurling the sails of your hope by believing that what comes at the very end of this message from Jesus is true. He says, God sent me into this world not to condemn you, not to make your life any heavier, not to burden you with yet more rules and more regulations, not to point a finger of guilt at you that you've done something wrong, not to ignore you when you are in need, not to let you just die in sickness without help coming to you. God sent me because God, what, so loved this world. Loved who? Loved you. So loves you that there is absolutely nothing this God will not forgive. Not forgive. Not understand. Not care not help, not heal, not embrace with a tenderness that steals the words from my heart. How can you be heavy with the lightness of the love of God lifting you up? How can you be worried when your life eternal is assured? How can you doubt when you are covered with the faith of Jesus of Nazareth who gave his life on the cross that you might be as light, as free as the wind itself, sailing, flying through the air to heaven on high. Whatever weights you down on this Sunday, Good Christian sister, good Christian brother, in the blessed name of Jesus, let it go. Let it go.
Do not be afraid. Do not be anxious. Do not be burdened. Do not be worried. Do not be guilty. Do not be anything that would hold you down from your dream and your imagination in Christ Jesus. But be you now free as a bird with wings unfurled to sail on the winds of heaven into the arms of a loving God. That's what Nicodemus learned that night, and that's what I hope each one of us has heard this morning.